waves slapped against the side of the wooden boat. The boat swayed slightly, docked on the shore, waiting, listening. How many sermons had this boat heard Jesus teach? How many miracles had this boat witnessed? How many trips from shore to shore carrying Jesus and his disciples? Boats are crucial in Jesus' ministry and Mark's gospel. This boat was no exception. This boat, like most boats, was a safe haven, a shelter among the sea, a respite from long and strenuous days of ministry, carrying weary men from shore to shore, from busy places to deserted places, providing rest, enabling mission, strong and brave, steady and experienced. Jesus had just sent out the 12 two by two to preach, heal, and proclaim the good news. And when they returned like children infused with excitement about a new talent or accomplishment, they report everything they had done and taught to Jesus. Jesus, master, we touched her and she was healed. We preached and they listened and repented. I imagine Jesus smiling at their enthusiasm. This was good work. The good work that Jesus had hoped and prayed they would participate in. But he stops them mid-sentence, saying, come away to a deserted place by, by yourselves and rest a while. The story tells us there were so many coming and going, the disciples had no moment of respite, not even to eat. The crowds fuel adrenaline, but solitude nourishes the soul. So Jesus leads them to the trusted boat resting on the shore. They quickly climb aboard and journey to a deserted place all by themselves. Or so they thought. Before they are able to receive the rest Jesus promised, crowds hurry on foot, seeing the boat and racing around the lake to meet them. And while Jesus has compassion on the people, seeing them like a sheep without a shepherd, his disciples are all but thrilled to see this deserted place is anything but deserted. Instead, it's full of hungry and needy people. As the boat waits patiently on the shore, the disciples disbelieve how they will ever feed over 5,000 people. They gripe and grumble to Jesus, while Jesus feeds the crowd's souls with his sermon and their stomachs with five loaves and two fish. Knowing his disciples are still weary, if not more so now, Jesus immediately forces them back on the boat to go to the other side while he dismisses the crowd. The story tells us that Jesus goes up on a mountain to pray. After a long day, he hikes with each step in conversation with God. Mountains, like boats, are very significant in Scripture. It is on a mountain where God reveals God's presence to Moses. It is on a mountain where Elijah experiences the presence of God in sheer silence. While Jesus is alone on the land, communing with God on a mountain, his disciples are out on a boat in the middle of the sea. It wasn't long before they felt that first gust of wind jolt the boat. Unsettled by the unexpected windstorm, the disciples are forced to quickly grab their oars and vigorously row, fighting the ferocious wind with every stroke. I grew up in Kansas. There is never a question if it will be windy in Kansas. 
Aaron and I both ran cross country and track as teenagers. And I remember track meets being canceled due to heavy winds. Or in some case, we would change the direction of the track meet so at least you could run with the wind and not against it. And our house growing up was constantly howling with the haunting winds. Recently, I've been rereading a book that my grandmother wrote about growing up in Kansas during the Great Depression of the 1930s. In one particular story, she describes the years nicknamed the Dust Bowl for the choking dust storms. A big black cloud came along the ground out of the west, and we could smell the dust. The dust was so thick you could hardly see to drive, and it was hard to breathe. When the storm hit, it was as dark as night, so the only place to be was inside. Her and her siblings quickly gathered and locked up all the chickens and closed all the windows to the house. She recalls holding a wet cloth over her nose so she could breathe. After these dust storms, everyone worked hard to get the dirt out of the house, some even using a grain scoop to get the dirt out. Wind is exhausting. We can imagine the disciples' dreadful plight. Early in the morning, they are awakened by crisis. How many hours did they row? Separated from Jesus, the disciples now look like the sheep without a shepherd. As much as they were annoyed to be eating lunch on the green grass with the massive crowds, I imagine they longed for those green pastures now. Dietrich Bonhoeffer describes the plight of the people without a shepherd in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. There are questions, but no answers. Distress, but no relief. Anguish of conscience, but no deliverance. Tears, but no consolation. We can feel their frustration at the wind, at the boat, at one another, at life, and more than likely, at Jesus. Where is Jesus? It was about 6 a.m. and our landlords, Dana and Alan Walton, received an anxious text from me about our 40-pound Australian shepherd named Ruby. Aaron woke at his usual time only to discover that our hyper-Aussie was not greeting him wagging her little nub of a tail like she usually does. In fact, she was not greeting him at all. Frantic, he ran into the bedroom to wake me. She's gone, Ruby is gone. Earlier that morning, about midnight, we were both awakened to a screaming baby. It is always disorienting being awakened in the middle of the night, no matter how many millions of times we have done that since our baby has been born, we never quite get used to it. So we stumbled around the house, fumbling to fill her bottle with milk, yet finally getting Cheney back to sleep. But by the time the alarm clock came and our dog Ruby was found to be missing, Aaron was convinced he must have taken Ruby outside to go the, to the bathroom at midnight and in the midst of our stupor, forgot to bring her back in. He drove around the neighborhood frightened, yelling her name, praying she would hear him and come running. I too joined in his efforts, yelling her name around the outside of our little apartment. Nothing. My mind assumed the worst. She's run away, she's been hit by a car, she's gone. I quickly made plans to print flyers and post them around the neighborhood, texting Dana to see if I could use her printer. I began praying aloud to God 
to intervene, to bring Ruby home. She was nowhere to be found. Whenever the disciples are separated from Jesus in the Gospels, they tend to flounder. When Jesus comes down from the mountain after his transfiguration, the disciples come to him, admitting their struggles to heal a young boy from demon possession. And when Jesus leaves them in the garden of the Gethsemane to keep watch while he goes off and prays before his betrayal and arrest, he comes back to find the disciples asleep, struggling to do what he has asked of them. And eventually, upon Jesus' arrest and sentencing, the disciples deny him and scatter. This scenario is no exception to this pattern. While separated from their master on the sea, Jesus sees the disciples struggle. In verse 48, the text tells us, when Jesus sees the disciples straining at the oars against an adverse wind, he came towards them early in the morning, walking on the sea, and he intended to pass them by. At first read, this seems rather cruel and neglectful of Jesus. Why would Jesus pass them by and not help them? The Old Testament has a clue towards Jesus' intentions, drawing us back to the intentions of God in Exodus chapter 33. Moses was anxious to know God's plan for his ministry and life. God reassures Moses, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. You have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. I will make all my goodness pass before you. God then comes close to Moses, God's glory passes by, and Moses sees the back of God. Likewise, in 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah is told to go up on a mountain, for the Lord is about to pass by. A great wind comes, then an earthquake, and then fire. But Elijah experiences God's presence passing by in sheer silence. Immediately upon seeing his disciples' distress, Jesus goes to them. Jesus' physical position on the mountain and his posture of prayer made him able to see the disciples and respond to their needs. Like God in Habakkuk who tramples the sea to save his people Israel, Jesus walks along the waves towards his disciples intending to pass them by, intending to come close and reveal his presence to them. Yet the darkness of the night and the dismal situation of the disciples pre prevents them from recognizing Jesus' presence. The story tells us they are so terrified, they cry out, thinking they've seen a ghost. And Jesus speaks to them, take heart, stop being afraid, it is I, or I am is here. And instead of passing them by so the disciples can see the back of God like Moses, Jesus climbs into the boat with them. The wind ceases. And while we would expect faithfulness and trust in Jesus to result from this consolation, miracle, and epiphany, the story ends in confusion. The disciples are still confused by the feeding miracle and their hearts are hardened, making it difficult for them to see the significance of God being revealed to them on the sea. Jesus, the very presence of God is sitting in their boat and they still cannot see. After our frantic search for our dog, Ruby, a thought occurred to me. 
I had not remembered Aaron taking Ruby outside at midnight when we were awake. What if she was in our little apartment? What if we could not see her and we could not find her anywhere, but she was there all along? I had the bizarre inclination to crack open the door to Cheney's bedroom. Immediately after sliding open the door, Ruby jumped into my lap and we collapsed on the floor while she happily licked my face. All along, Ruby was there, sitting patiently, silent in the baby's room as to not wake her. Ruby was there. She was right under our noses. For the first time, Corey Ten Boom felt lost and afraid. The Ten Booms were a Christian family living in Holland, hiding Jews in their home during the Nazi Reich. After being discovered, Corey and her fa entire family were arrested in Harlem, Holland. After being sent to various concentration camps, Corey was the only survivor of the Holocaust from her family. After her freedom, she spent the remainder of her life traveling the world, sharing the good news of Jesus. But at one point in her ministry, she found herself lost, confused, and uncertain about God's plan for her. She says, as I stood in the railroad station in Switzerland, waiting for my luggage, I suddenly realized that I did not know where I was supposed to go. For 10 years after my release from prison, I had been traveling all over the world at the direction of God. But this time was different. Sleeping each night in a different bed and always living out of a suitcase had worn me down. At 63 years of age, I was wondering if I had been so overlooked that I was losing my memory. I felt a sense of panic in my heart and sat down trying to remember to whom I was going. Had God withdrawn his conscious presence from me, letting me walk this season alone? For 10 years, the Lord had guided me step by step, and at no time had I been confused or afraid. Now I was both, unable to recognize the presence of God. Surely he was still guiding me, but like a pilot who flies into the clouds, I was now having to rely on instruments rather than sight. Corey decided to travel home to Holland until she could sense God's direction again. After arriving in Harlem, she slipped on the wet pavement, injuring her hip. She cried out to God in prayer, and a police officer offered her some help, asking her name. Corey Ten Boom, to which he replied, are you a member of the family of that name whom I arrested 10 years ago? This Dutch police officer had been on duty the night Corey's family was arrested. I'm so sorry for your accident, he said sympathetically, but I am so glad to see you again. I will never forget that night in the police station. You were all sitting or lying on the floor of the station. Your old father was there with all his children and a lot of your friends. I've often told my colleagues that there was an atmosphere of peace and joy in our station that night, as if you were headed to a feast instead of prison and death. He paused and looked at me kindly as if trying to remember my face. Your father said before he tried to sleep, let us pray together. And then he read Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Corey writes, now the message was clear. Although there was no light to guide me, 
I was still in God's will. Actually, when one is abiding under the shadow of the Almighty, there will be no light. But that is only because God's presence is so near. I leaned back in my seat. Dear God, when the shadow came over me, I thought you had departed. Now I understand it was because you were drawing closer. Where is Jesus? It was not long after the disciples asked this question that Jesus was in their boat staring them in the face. Yet they still could not understand and their hearts were hardened. Where is Jesus in your life? We often find ourselves judging the disciples as we read the gospel stories. How could they be so ignorant? Until we look within and we realize that we are all one of them. We too can find ourselves struggling, our circumstances causing us to row against the wind, straining at the oars of life, moving from task to task, doing work, often good work, but exhausted. We too can live at a pace that precludes us from seeing the presence of God passing by. We can be physically present, but spiritually absent to our own lives. Our hearts can become hardened And while Jesus continues to reveal himself, we can fail to recognize him. The truth of Mark's gospel story is right under our noses. We are the sheep without a shepherd. We are the ones to whom Christ has come to save. Jesus' intention is to always pass us by to draw near, to enter our lives, our struggles, our circumstances, and live with us. Jesus climbs into the boat, and yet the disciples are confused and their hearts are hardened to see the significance. The presence of Jesus is so close, so close they could not see. Where is Jesus in your life? Where is Jesus present where you cannot see? Mark is inviting us to ask the question for ourselves whether we are like the disciples, watching events happening, but drawing the the wrong conclusions. Where is Jesus? Mark's gospel answers us, he's right in front of you. But then Mark's gospel turns to the disciples and turns to us and asks us a different question. How is your heart? Is your heart hardened? Or has your heart been softened or opened to believe the extraordinary things that are happening before our eyes? Because the most miraculous aspect of Mark's story is not Jesus walking on the waves, but that the God of all creation is passing by. And this time, it is not on a mountain. This time, it is not God's back. This time, it is not in sheer silence. This time, it is in flesh and blood. This time, Jesus comes into the boat The psalmist discovered this truth when he wrote, where can I go from your spirit and where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. 
Where is Jesus in your life? The presence of Jesus is so close, so close. We just might be missing it. Let us pray. God, we long to have open hearts, to have softened hearts, but that's not always the case. Like the disciples in this story, we too can have hearts that become hardened. Whether that's by sin in our lives or circumstances around us, our own busyness and hurry sickness, whatever that may be, it happens. We can look so much like these disciples in this boat, terrified. But God, we've learned a truth today that whether we feel you, whether we see you, you are here and you are close. Your presence is with us. So God, I pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts to see you, to recognize you in our lives, moving and working, and that we would respond to you, that we would follow, follow the way. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.